He was the right-hand man of Joan of Arc, and the single richest and most powerful nobleman of Anjou. He was a war hero, the Marshal of France, but he has also been described as the most horrific serial killer in French history, a man who inspired the grisly tale of Bluebeard. In this video, we're going to look at Gilles de Rey, the man who supposedly sold his soul to the devil and eventually paid the ultimate price. Welcome to Medieval Madness. The Family Gilles de Montmorency Laval was born in 1404 at Machecoul in the region of Rise in Anjou. Little is known about his parents, but his birth was well received and many of the nearby nobility were invited to his christening at the village church. De Ray was a bright boy and his family were extremely wealthy, so no expense was spared on his education. He was an enthusiastic pupil and became fluent in Latin, he read and illustrated illuminated manuscripts, later becoming a great patron of the arts. He was particularly interested in the demands of physical training and military strategies. Sadly, his father Guy de Laval was killed in a hunting accident with a wild boar when de Rays was just 10 years old. His mother Marie de Crayon also died a few months later, and Jill, now 11, along with his younger brother René, became a ward of his maternal grandfather, Jean de Crayon. De Crayon was an unprincipled, ambitious, and greedy man of questionable morals, who looked on his adoption of the children as a way to increase his personal wealth. He tried to marry the 13-year-old De Ray to a very rich orphan from Normandy, but as she was only four years old, the plan failed. Eventually, he was married in 1420 at the age of 16 to the heiress Catherine de Thors of Brittany. This made Jill de Ray's and his grandfather incredibly wealthy, and it was said that de Ray's kept a more lavish court than the French king himself. The War The de Ray's family were a French noble family, and as such, they had a duty to protect the kingdom from attack and support their king. The Hundred Year War with England had been raging on since 1337, with the two countries fighting for the claim to the French throne. De Rays got caught up in the conflict when his new home of Brittany became a contested territory. In 1427, De Rays got his first chance to go to war. He was impulsive but passionate on the battlefield, making him a competent and fearless fighter. He was so well trusted by the Dauphin Charles VII that he was asked to watch over Joan of Arc during the battle when she came on the scene in 1429. They fought together several times, most notably at the liberation of the city of Orléans from the English. Subsequently, Charles made de Ray Marshal of France when he was just 24 years old, a military distinction that is only granted for outstanding achievements, quote, for his commendable services and many brave feats. Joan and de Ray's were together to see their beloved Dauphin crowned King Charles VII of France at Reims Cathedral, but Joan was captured by the English and burned to death at Rouen in 1341. Now de Ray's could devote more time to his estates, and he became known for his extravagant nature. Spending recklessly, he squandered huge sums on servants, art, tapestries, books, and furniture. He was not adverse to selling off family lands when he needed to top up his personal wealth either, much to his grandfather's disgust. In fact, when Jean de Crown died, he left his sword and breastplate to Deray's brother, René, as a gesture of displeasure. But his grandfather's death only meant that de Rays was free to spend one of the largest personal fortunes in France unchallenged. The Bazaar Seemingly concerned with his own redemption, de Rays turned to religion and financed the building of his own personal chapel for the bliss of his soul. He officiated over prayers there and held mass in elaborate robes that he had designed himself. He called it the Chapel of the Holy Innocents and filled it with a choir of young boys, who were all handpicked by de Rays himself. Then he produced the mystery play of the Siege of Orléans, a theatrical extravaganza with at least 150 actors and 500 other crew members. Some 600 costumes were made and then thrown away, after only being used once, before new ones were constructed for future performances. Nobody told him that fast fashion is bad. De Ray even paid people to come and watch his play and provided an unlimited quantity of food and drink for all. 
The entire event almost bankrupted him, and he sold off a lot of his wife's jewellery and some more properties to recoup his losses. His family petitioned Pope Eugene IV, as well as the King of France himself, to try and prevent him from selling off any more. Although the Pope refused to become embroiled in the matter, a royal decree prohibited him from selling off any more of the family's property. The Occult And this is when his life took a darker turn. His attention turned to alchemy and the occult as a way to help him save his swiftly failing finances. He employed the knowledge of a series of sorcerers and alchemists. Two particularly sinister men who Derez became involved with in 1438 were the priest Eustache Blanchet and the Italian cleric Francesco Prelati, who was supposedly able to conjure demons. At his castle in Tiforge, attempts were made to summon a demon named Baron so that Derez could sign a contract with the evil spirit in the hope that it would restore his wealth and reputation by occult means. As no demon was manifested after three tries, Prelati insisted that the sacrifice for child's body parts were needed. Although Derez provided these in a glass container, the black magic didn't work, and he was left angry and even poorer. The Murders So did Jill suddenly find some bits of a dead child lying around, or was there something even more disturbing going on at the castle? It seems that children had been going missing in all of the areas around the DeRay's residencies for years. It is alleged that after the spring of 1432, every one of DeRay's properties had pleasure rooms where he and his companions abandoned themselves to their sexual indulgences, and sadly the disappearances of young boys were connected to these activities. The first case was that of a boy named Judon, who was local to Mashkul. He was hired to take a message to the castle by two of Deray's cousins. When Judon didn't return home, it was assumed that he had been kidnapped by thieves. Many of the children went into Mashkul Castle and never left, enticed there with promises of food or other distractions. It was said that once inside the chateau, the abducted child would be indulged and dressed up in expensive clothing. Deray's and his accomplices would partake in an indulgent meal with heavy drinking before the youngster was taken to his special room. Once there, as Deray's bodyguard later testified, his master would hang the boys from ropes before abuse and torture took place, followed by murder by decapitation and then dismemberment. The servants would then dispose of the dissected pieces by burning them in the fireplaces around the castle. There were said to be somewhere between 80 and 200 victims, ranging in age from 7 to 20, but the real number is unknown as most of the bodies were either buried or burned. It was quite common in the Middle Ages for young boys to be taken in by nobles as pages or servants, so many of the boys' families would have been simply unaware of their child's death. In many areas though, DeRay's sick predilections were being whispered about. The victims' families were often told that the English had taken their children, and because of their low social standing, they were too afraid to speak out. The Trial Despite the rumours, Derez wasn't arrested until 1440 when his men kidnapped a cleric after an unrelated dispute. An investigation was launched and the church uncovered evidence of the child murders. Derez was tried for offences such as sodomy, heresy, and murder by both the civil and ecclesiastic courts. His servants admitted to kidnapping boys for him to molest and murder. Two French priests testified that he was obsessed with the occult and used the limbs of children in his dark art rituals. Derez claimed innocence at first, but was threatened with torture and excommunication. It seems that Derez was very religious, and believing himself to be in danger of spending eternity in the fires of hell, he confessed all of his nauseating offences that had gone on for over a decade. The civil court found him guilty of murder, the church of heresy, and he was sentenced to death. He was hanged and then burned on October the 26th, 1440, with two of his accomplices in Nantes. Because Derez had confessed and shown contrition, he was escorted to the place of his execution by the bishop and the crowd chanted prayers for his soul. Bizarrely, this also meant that a three-day fast was followed by the people of Nantes after his death as he was seen as a model of Christian penitence. Ironically, on the anniversary of his execution, the parents of Nantes would commemorate the salvation of Deray by whipping their children. The Truth 
Gilderay was always going to have a place in medieval history because of his great military career and his connection to Joan of Arc. Today though, these achievements have been overshadowed with his secret life as one of the first recorded serial killers and a perpetrator of hundreds of gruesome child murders. But is there more to this story than meets the eye? There is an alternative narrative, one which claims that DeRay was actually innocent and set up by the authorities. He had property and land that was of interest to the Duke of Brittany and the Bishop of Nantes. His confession was taken under threat of torture and it is thought that he was an openly gay man despite his marriage. Let's face it, he wouldn't be the first unconventional European that was stripped of power and wealth by jealous rivals. Just look at the Knights Templars and Elizabeth Bathory. The French folktale Bluebeard, first published at the end of the 17th century about a man who routinely murders his wives, is thought to have been based loosely on the life of Gil de Rey. Thank you for watching this episode of Medieval Madness, do hope you've enjoyed it and please subscribe to keep up to date with the channel. Cheers!